We're live. Gordon, take it off. Let's start it again. Good morning, everyone. This is DLT Fridays, the highest energy show in crypto. Yes, it is six o'clock in the morning in California. And you know what? I am out of sleep. And I think all my fellow fellow guests are a little bit shocked in my energy change right now. But you know what? I can turn it on on a dime. Right, Brittany? Brittany? Sorry. There you go. Oh, absolutely. I know exactly what you mean. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Good morning. And of course, we got everyone here. We got my buddy, James Haft, who will pronounce my name correctly this time from Powell Capital. James, good to see you. My, I have my good buddy, Luke Stokes. You know, I think I need to actually meet him in person one day. And Delia Atanda, my friend, my new friend, nice to meet you, except my LinkedIn request. Don't make me a little biatch, and you know what I'm saying. Come on, bring, bring it on, okay? So anyways, this is DLT Fridays. We're here to build community. We're here to make connections. We're here to go deep and philosophical. We're here, to, we're here this morning to nerd out. And yes, I'm a fast hockey dude. I'm high energy. I reserve the right to interrupt at any time. And if I, if I do interrupt, it's because I'm interested. And I also want to give a big shout out to our massive organizer behind the scenes, Jane. Actually, James, I think you should thank Jane for putting this all together on short notice. So I'm going to pass it back to you just for that purpose. And by the way, it's Gordon Einstein, my friend. Love you, brother. Try that. We'll, we'll, we'll try and get that right. We'll live that down at some and point. I say, just sorry, one, last time I was Gordon Epstein, I was like, I didn't commit suicide <laughs> in a federal cell on that's video with 20 guards watching. What's interesting yeah. is it, what's interesting is that you naturally thought that was Jeffrey Epstein, and I thought it was Boris Epstein. So it's just a little. God, why, why ever would I make that connection? Why wouldn't I just naturally come to yours? I don't know. Yours is so much more logical and intuitive, James. But please go on. So to, bring, so to bring this down, bring the, bring the energy down, because Gordon hasn't shared his meds. Um, you know, my meds is ginger turmeric tea. Exactly. Oh, nice. Okay, please go on. So, so I, you know, uh, I formed Pal Capital in 1996 to focus on businesses and uh, on the changes that the digitization of information was going to bring to business, society, politics, education, and religion, and how decentralization uh, and peer-to-peer -peer technologies were going to come about and change the world in 1996. In 1996, everyone said to me, that's crazy. Go back to investment banking. That's not a business. Uh, <laughs> and today, everyone says, that's crazy. You know, th that's not a business. That's every business. Uh, so uh, we're here today to talk about uh, identity and privacy. And what I want to do is put each of those concepts into context and then talk about how they balance and deal with each other because we all want to be known. We all want to get attribution. We all want to participate and have access, right? And to do that, you need identity to some extent. You need to be, you need to be addressed. You need to be dealt with. You need to be able to come back and, and, and have some level of continuity uh, in your relationship. On the other hand, you know, we have this sense that privacy is no longer just something you talk about. It's no longer something that's, you know, free, uh, uh, you know, and, and a, a God-given right. You know, we've started to realize that there's a lot of people around us who are paying attention to who we are and what we've done and putting it into a filter and into a light which we might not agree with. Uh, and, you know, possibly making a trade with us which we didn't understand. Uh, and then using that information in ways which we might not benefit for or agree or, or may not have agreed to or wouldn't have agreed to if we understood. Uh, and so uh, we have three great panelists today. Really, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to shut up so you guys can talk. Uh, you know, really, so Brittany Kaiser, uh, and, uh, who's, you know, uh, spearheading, found, uh, you know, uh, own your own data uh, and, you know, is, you know, a legend in her own right. And we really appreciate having you here, Brittany. Thank you. Uh, Luke Stokes, who really is known globally, you know, for, for uh, the banner of, of digital ID uh, and, and how to protect. And, uh, and Delhi, you know, who I've known for four or five years now, uh, you know, who really uh, is one of the persons who made me understand the value of identity and data uh, and how it's being used and how we can turn that equation around to benefit ourselves uh, as opposed to benefit the system. Uh, so I'd like you guys to start first with a little bit of context about yourself personally, you know, not so much your resume as much as why this subject matters to you and, and how this became personal and how the passion developed. And if I may, I, I, my favorite analogy is, you know, the, I like origin stories, like Marvel origin stories, like Wolverine, the origin story. So give us, go even back a little bit more because anyone who's into this space always had an interesting path before their, even their interest in the space to kind of prep them for it. So just give us more. I want more from all of you. And 
you know, I'm just gonna go in the order that I see on my screen. So Brittany, I'm pointing at you whether you can tell it or not, okay? I'm giving you a virtual Zoom point. You go first and then we'll, we'll work our way over. Yeah, absolutely. So origin story. Um, I guess I could uh, go back to when I first got involved with technology, which mm. was on the first Obama campaign in 2007. I quit college to move back home to Chicago where my parents live, where I grew up and joined the headquarters team, the new media team. And uh, that was, I mean, back in the day, new media was the combination of data engineering and data science. It was digital content and editing. It was social media. We were the team that invented social media strategy and a lot of data-driven advertising that came out of the first Obama campaign. And so our team were the first people to really experiment with collecting data off of social media. And, and, and I, I remember that. I think you were, you were, that was the first campaign that truly made use of social media in a game-changing kind of way. Like, I think Absolutely. it had been dabbled slightly before, but maybe the tools weren't there, but you, I think your group, the tools were available and you recognized they were available, which is two separate things. Right, I mean, we also luckily had Chris Hughes, co-founder of Facebook, who I went to high school with on the team. So yeah. in, in the beginning, there were just five of us. And every time we wanted to use Facebook for something new, he could actually just add it as a new Facebook feature. Huh. Um, so in fact, uh, the like was invented because uh, we started having over a hundred different interns uh, that were that were basically having to spend their time deciding whether or not someone was allowed to be Barack Obama's friend, basically vetting mm -hmm. friends. And if you had drugs, guns, or nudity in your photo, you couldn't be Barack Obama's friend. So I'm sitting there. So you eliminated all the fun people? <laughs> what the heck? We were eliminating the liabilities for a presidential candidate and senator, oh, right? Got it. And uh, so at that time, when you know I have a hundred college students going through these one by one, we thought, hey, like we can't be wasting smart people's time that really are here because they want to make an impact and they want to use uh, learn how to use new technologies. Uh, so we're just going to make Barack Obama someone that you can't friend. So you can mm. you know, like him, follow him. And that the entity, which is now used for businesses, public people, politicians, whatever, uh, was invented for uh, Senator Obama, right? Mm. And so uh, that was the beginning of my foray into technology where I saw that the more data that you could collect off of social media, the better... Uh, engagement you would have with all of your messaging. So we started to create targeted messaging based off of the data we were collecting, um, not just off of Facebook, but across uh, social media, which at the time, like no one was even using Twitter. We were still using MySpace um, for our international fans who are using Bebo, uh, Pinterest, YouTube, you know what I mean? So it was super early on. And uh, what I really- But, but after MySpace. What? <laughs> but after MySpace. Yeah, you and know, um, MySpace, we actually used a lot in the beginning. This is 2007. Like, oh not that many okay. people were on Twitter. It wasn't a thing. And we saw that the more data that you had, uh, the more impactful you could be. You know, the more data we knew about someone, the more likely we were to get them to register to vote for the first time, mm -hmm. to get them to care about issues that were important to them and their families, to get involved in community work, to actually really care and to engage. And so after the Obama campaign, instead of going to work on communications in the White House, I spent nearly the next decade um, running around the world, teaching different organizations, mostly nonprofits and charities, United Nations, NGOs and departments, how to use these types of data-driven technologies. How could you collect data about people in a way that was meaningful enough where you could start to do targeted communications and be much more successful in your campaigns? Now, I'm, already, I'm already gonna dive into the controversial back end. I, the irony of what happened later <laughs> eluded me before, but I'm seeing a lot of dark side, light side force action. Yeah, a hundred percent. With your engagement in social media. And there's I mean, an irony 100%. here that I didn't know about that. <laughs> so Brittany, there, there's, uh, you missed one company when you were advising though, which, I, which would have certainly helped. I was, uh, I was uh, advisor to the board of Air America. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. So in, the, in 2007, 2008, we, we, you know, to try and help, desperately help Barack Obama get elected. And we were so incompetent digitally that it was scary. You, you say Air America, I think about the CIA airlines. 
Uh, Arab, Arab America was was a was a was a a, liber, a, a left wing radio that, that station, mm. globally, uh, mostly digital, uh, that was trying to uh, support you know Obama in two thousand seven two thousand eight, backed by Stephen Green and uh, Al uh, Al Franken. Uh, we, mm. we we actually found Rachel Maddow of all things, uh, you know, and then and then uh, let she went to MSNBC and, and when she left, left such a large hole that the company fell apart. Oh, wow. uh, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. No, not at all. I mean, back then, no one had data-driven strategy, let alone you know social media strategy. That wasn't you know no one was using social except for peer-to-peer -peer communication. Mm. Um, so that I mean, most books that you read on data-driven advertising and a lot of the uh, kind of privacy-disabling technologies that you'll read about today, a lot of that unfortunately came from the first Obama campaign where we really intended to do positive work. And so that was my impression. You know, you can call me naive, you can call me uh, eternally optimistic, which is what I prefer. <laughs> and uh, I continued to use these technologies for what I saw as positive social impact. I was studying as a human rights lawyer and working for a lot of human rights organizations. And that's surprisingly how I joined Cambridge Analytica. Um, mm. I was training as a barrister in the United Kingdom and uh, working on uh, public international law, on international human rights law specifically, and writing my doctoral thesis on something called preventive diplomacy. Mm -hmm. Now, preventive diplomacy means how do you prevent war crimes, crimes against humanity, um, crimes of aggression. And what my PhD actually ended up being about was predictive analytics. And at the time I knew nearly nothing about that, uh, although we had started to build kind of basic models on the first Obama campaign, I wasn't on the 2012 campaign, so I didn't really get into the full-blown, uh, you know, data-driven analytics strategy. And what I realized is I'm not writing a PhD on how heads of state negotiate with each other and tactics and diplomacy. I'm actually writing about how much data do they have access to and who is modeling that data, who's analyzing it, and how quickly does that information get to the decision makers in order for them to make a decision that could prevent something from happening. Mm -hmm. So it's how much data do you have? Who's modeling it and how? And what are the mechanisms that actually get that information into the hands of someone who can prevent a crisis? Uh, I, I gotta tell you, this sounds a little bit like Minority Report pre crime <laughs> Well, you know, uh, I joined Cambridge Analytica more because of their military background and what they mm -hmm. could actually do in terms of preventing the loss of human life and preventing mass mm -hmm. violence. So I went there to learn and I was um, doing my PhD full time and took a part time consultancy at Cambridge Analytica to learn how to do predictive analytics mm -hmm. and really understand what it was so that I could finish my doctoral thesis. And, then, and uh, I think a lot of people know how that turned yeah, out. Um, <laughs> but well, give, give us the headline because I, you know, I, I, I read up on you actually in prep for this, but there's, there's some nuance yeah. there. Well, I, I spent um, nearly four years at this company going around the world teaching uh, politicians and political parties, governments, militaries, and big corporations exactly how to run a data-driven strategy, doing, um, doing audits of what type of data they had, bringing in teams of data scientists and data engineers to get that hygiened and ready for a modeling program, building out modeling programs, and uh, targeted advertising or communications programs so that they could not only understand what they needed to do um, in a scientific way for internal strategy, but also so that they could do targeted external communications. And mm -hmm. that could be everything from trying to get uh, their, you know, their people to drink clean water um, or use modern hospitals instead of witch doctors. Um, but, 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 but fast forward to the controversy, because I also want to make sure we get our other guests in there. Actually, Brittany's fantastic, and I could listen for like eight hours. No, no, I'll, I'll, fa I'll fast forward, I mean, but so anyway. What, what are you doing now, or is? Things in data yeah. analytics, but, what I realized was yeah. that you could buy data on anybody in the world, and especially in the United States, you could buy so much data about someone that you would know more about them than they knew about themselves. And when I started to look at my data, when I started to look at the data of my friends and family, because a lot of the people that I was pitching projects to were my friends, so they wanted to see their Cambridge Analytica data file before they would sign a contract with me. Um, 
I started to realize, hey, you know, when did we ever opt into this? When did we ever consent to this? And since I have four law degrees, I started actually looking into the legal structure of this and realizing that in the United States, we had zero rights, no rights to privacy, even though somehow we've signed up to all these international agreements saying that privacy is a human right. Well, you know, I'm a human rights lawyer. I know how incredibly difficult it is to uphold human rights in a court of law. And to say that we have a human right to privacy is to actually undermine not just the human rights legal framework, but the idea of privacy itself, because privacy doesn't exist. Actually, um, Brittany, let, let, let me pause for one second, because th that I want to make the meat of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And I want to I want to go deep, but I wanna, also want to bring everyone else in. So it's like, a, and I, the reason, it's just it's fascinating to listen to you. That, that was kind of, I just went with it. So Luke, That's, you're next on my screen. You may not awesome. know it, but I'm pointing to you right now. Okay. Happy I'm to jump in. Yes, Luke, origin story. Yeah, thank you're you for your so, so I, I've been in technology for a long time. I built my first websites in 96, a major in computer science. Uh, I was very passionate about this. I built a company called Foxcart. It was an e-commerce shopping cart. So I was familiar with the payment space and all that. And I kind of got introduced in uh, late 2012, early 2013 to this crazy internet money, Bitcoin thing. And I started looking into this and I'm going, wait a minute, if you can have money without government, what else can you have without government? And I started to go down the rabbit hole of what is government? And, and, you know, even people that are strong supporters of government and, and Brittany, you know, you and I are friends, but we probably have, are on the opposite poles of this, which is so beautiful because we have the same goal, which is human freedom, which I absolutely love. So it's so great to, to chat with you. But it was this idea of learning about democide and 260 million people, you know, attributed to the actions of government killed by government. Democide. What was the word you really used, Luke? What's this? Democide? demo side there's a there's a, a research analyst he's passed away but he did this work in hawaii and i, I highly encourage everyone to understand this word demo side it's mm -hmm. one that should be the forefront of if we actually care about human life and these are deaths that should not have happened these are these are just really preventable deaths attributed directly to the actions of, of government and even those who support government generally agree with the definition that i've come to understand which is you know a nation state government is basically a monopoly on the initiation of violent force in a geographic region. They're also a monopoly on currency creation. They're a monopoly on law and justice and these other things. And, and you know, I've, I've, I've definitely swung the pendulum many directions as far as my personal beliefs on this. Uh, but I did, I did kind of go down the rabbit hole of being labeled the voluntarist or an anarchist, someone who says that we should live without rulers, not without rules, but without rulers. Because really, we are self-sovereign individuals. We should be able to control our own store of value, control our own identities as well, and the data about ourselves. So as I started going down this route, I got very interested again in the blockchain space. I uh, found the Steam blockchain, which is now the Hive blockchain. It's a, a way you can blog on an immutable social media platform that you control your content. No one can censor you. No one can you know, take away your content. And that became really important to me. Uh, but a few years ago, I did a post about identity and human flourishing, privacy, identity, and all these, how they all relate together. And I started thinking about, well, if we did have a stateless society, if all human interactions were voluntary, what would it look like to actually trust someone enough to go and do business with them? And I started realizing it's not just about encryption and privacy and controlling. I, I realized I actually also want radical transparency. I actually want to know who I'm doing business with. And if it, today, if you meet someone on the street, you're like, well, okay, you're not in jail. So at least the violent government in your jurisdiction thinks you're okay, at least for today, right? Uh, or they haven't caught you yet, one or the other, right? And so you have this like base level reputational system that the government provides us. And as I started thinking through and studying non-aggression principles, studying these other different universally preferred behaviors, these different moral frameworks for how humans could interact without- Wait, Universally preferred behaviors? Yeah, universally preferred behavior. There's many okay. different you know, ways to think about uh, restructuring human motivational psychology Lots of violence or corrupt, you know. Uh... Is that Luke or me? No, nah, it's Luke. Luke, 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 Luke. All, all, all that thought your internet's getting. I, I cut out just a little bit. I, I know I, the, the internet here in Puerto Rico, for whatever Luke, reason Luke, lately, Luke. it started to cut in and out a little bit. So, the, in summary, I, I started to recognize that we needed a way to have both. We need radical, intense privacy where I can fully control my. Uh, okay, I, 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 Luke, Luke, hold that thought. Della, my, my new friend. <laughs> okay. 
Um, or, or origin story. Let, 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 tell us about you. And sure. nice to meet you. Pleasure. Um, origin story is great context. Well, I mean, my it, it, I, I le reflected on this in the last year and it was lost to me at the time. But my first job in digital, my first actual, my first real job was with the Central Office of Information in the UK, which was like a government agency. Wait, isn't that from a George, isn't that from an Orwell book? <laughs> well, exactly. George Orwell worked there, and that was it, it <laughs> apparently what inspired the Ministry of Truth in exactly. 1984. So um, that kind of way, and, and my 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 first line manager was actually previously head of anti-Soviet propaganda for the UK during the Cold War. So it was, that's sort of where I kind of came into the whole industry. But at the time I was completely oblivious to that. I was really more just fascinated by this new phenomenon of the internet that had emerged. And I was a producer at the COI working between government agencies and, um, and, and digital marketing agencies. So I got into the industry in that context. And I think my, my interest in data really began when I was at Diageo. So I used to, I headed up digital for Diageo at the time. And we used to do a lot of engagement and, you know, it was really, we were really pushing. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not quite catching the name of the company or the organization, Diageo. Diageo. So Diageo was like, it is the world's number one alcoholic beverage company. So oh, they okay. own like Smirnoff, Guinness, Johnny Walker. As a consumer brand, they're kind of invisible, but- At least the like, pusher man. Well, totally, absolutely. All, all the people who can't be Obama's friend. Well, actually, you know, it's a really interesting thing because when I joined Diageo, I was recruited because my boss at the time the, who recruited me in there, his remit was that we need to understand this Web 2.0 thing. And Diageo was quite active digitally um, compared to other organizations at the time, but they were in a very Web 1.0 space and they were trying to figure out this Web 2.0 space. And bizarrely enough, you know, my kind of, you know, endorsement of a successful job, which uh, when, where, uh, was when Facebook actually did its IPO, Diageo was the single reference case that they gave when they did their roadshow around corporate participation with, with social media, with, with their platform. And that was primarily around work that we did with the Smirnoff brand. So that was very sort of groundbreaking in terms of digital engagement. But interestingly enough, I think for me, when I actually, and particularly the Smirnoff campaign, particularly, it's, you know, it's funny, you know, Steve Jobs always said that thing about the dots connect and you kind of start to see the patterns in your life. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when, when I think, when I've looked at Smirnoff particularly, what got me interested in data was that I really brought into this whole vision of the internet giving us this hyper-personalized experience and this hyper customized and hyper curated kind um, line of services. And my analogy was always, if I go to Prague and I used to travel a lot on business, I was always in global roles. And if I land in a new country, I would want three restaurants. Um, if I wanted to find somewhere to go and eat, my question was, you know, if I go to Google, I get these hundred results or hundreds of results, but they're not really about restaurants that I really want to go to. I'd really rather just have three that was based on places that I think food that I like, you know, places that I'd be, that I would normally go to. And as I thought about that, I realized that in order to get that level of personalization and, and, and targeting, you know, to, to talk in Britney speak <laughs> in that regards, right? Um, that- um, and, but, and, and, and you know, it's interesting here, the fact that you highlighted that word kind of brought to me a conscious awareness that that word is loaded in a totally. way that I, that I hadn't fully appreciated before. Totally. Like targeted, like shooting at something as opposed to say identified or something. Well, absolutely. So it's kind of like this subtle use of language there. Like, thank you. You know, I, I just picked up on the nuance because of the way that you hit it, so go on. And I think that's actually, you're, you're touching on an important point because we need to formulate the language to be able to unpack this stuff and, and navigate our way through it um, appropriately. But, but absolutely, yes, you know, I mean, I originally came into the space thinking, how can we better target? How can we deliver better experiences? But the more I started to understand that space, I started to realize that, well, in order to get that better kind of curation and personalization, 
we'd have to share all of this information with these digital giants like um, um, Google, Facebook and whatnot. And then I started to question, well, do I trust those entities? What are they doing with my data? Do I really want to give my information to them? And as I, and literally it was like, you know, down the rabbit hole I went and I started, as I explored it more, I started to see that there were big social issues, big civil rights issues, big human rights issues around the use of our data. And I think, and, and interestingly enough, at the time I was writing a book, I was writing a book about Web 3.0, and this is like back in 2009, 2010. So at this point, the Arab Springs had started to happen around the world. And it was becoming clear that digital was this cultural phenomenon that was able to drive significant macro change around the world. And this was evident with the Arab Springs. It was like, you know, Twitter, particularly at the time, was a driving force for big social revolution and change. Uh, but, and that was phenomenal and really exciting. But what dawned on me at that time, looking at it through the lens of data, was that for the first time, people's lives were at risk at data from their digital footprint. When you looked at activists in, in, in the Middle East and, and, and in Africa at the time, you know, people's lives were, physic were, were physically in danger. And that became really fascinating to me in terms of the, the threat and potential of data in that regard. So we started working on technologies that could um, enable people to have more privacy. And we started to understand this issue of human rights and privacy and communication and free speech and messaging. And so, that, so at that time, we started looking at things like Tor, Tor network and secure messaging and secure communication. And then Snowden Gate happened. And it was literally like the world changed, you know, effectively what we were, we were originally looking at places like Syria and Afghanistan and thinking, how could we bring journalists and activists together through technology? Those were, those were more innocent days. Yeah, absolutely right. By far. And so suddenly, you know, the threat in Syria was in New York, it was in London, it was in Berlin, it was a global thing. And there was a lot of mischief that was being coordinated and it's, it's brilliant, you know, Brittany and I talk about this a lot, but that overlap then, because even in Obama's administration then, you started to see that there was this really tumultuous and precarious relationship between government and big corporations around data in this sense. And particularly when the Snowden, and bear in mind that Snowden Gate happened under Obama's watch, right? And of course, we're all huge fans of Obama for multiple reasons, but we have to be, <laughs> we have to be frank about this, right? And what became clear was that you couldn't address this from a local perspective, because on one hand, the NSA was saying, we're not spying on US citizens, because even though they were, but you know, we're spying on international citizens, but US citizens are sacrosanct. GC, G, um, GCHQ was saying in the UK, well, I mean, they, well, the, the UK has got a very different perspective. They spy on everyone anyway. But what was really happening was that, you know, the NSA, all these nations- They were just trading, right? Exactly. You spy, on, you spy on ours, we spy on yours, and exactly. what is it? Exactly, like the five eyes. So what became very clear was that we needed to think of this from a universal perspective. Mm -hmm. So for us then it was really about, okay, what is our North Star? It's got to be human rights. And if you think about human rights, and it really, it really was how do we bring this, these principles of human rights into cyberspace? What does free speech mean in the context of a digital world? What does the right to assembly mean in the context of a digital world? What does the right to property mean in the context of a digital world, etc. Let, let, let me pause one second, because you're- Gordon, you're, you're, Gordon, you're, Gordon, you're, Gordon, 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 one, one of our uh, attendees wrote in basically that nations own their citizens and send them to war and tell them, you know, and give them the framework within the head to live. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. And I'd like to bring that back to the panelists right now and talk about this, what where, where Delhi was just leaving off, which is local versus global. Because I think that's one of the big changes that's happening right now. And, the, you know, the history of time, uh, Po politics have followed military right and, and communications technologies in how you define what the power entities are within politics. And I think we're going through a big change right now in terms of becoming global, whether you like it or not. You can try and be local, but that's almost impossible. And the definition of local is actually changing. So I'd love to hear you guys talk about how that's impacting us right now, you know, and, 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 you know, and what are the costs and what are the opportunities there? 
Yeah, well, I mean, I, I really think that uh, the main the main reason why I've been working local is because working on privacy and data protection at a global level has so far been completely unsuccessful. Um, you know, we, we can make all the international agreements that we want. We can have privacy as a human right, but ratifying that at a local level where we actually have the right to our data, where we can protect our data under the eyes of the law, um, doing, doing that globally is, you know, idealistic and gives us kind of uh, something to shoot for. But what it needs to what needs to be done is that it's ratified locally. So I've been working state by state in the United States and country by country to help governments actually write the laws that they require. Dele does a lot of this work. We do some of this work together, which is really fun. And it, it, it's really helping make sure that in a local context, that there are ways for us to protect our data and that we have legal recourse if our data is abused so that there's some type of deterrent for our data to be abused, especially by big corporates, but obviously also governments. So for example, in the state of Wyoming, that's the first place where we have owned our digital assets as our intangible personal property since March, 2018. And in the state of Minnesota, you own your data as your property because the case, the first case that we won against Equifax, we sued them for property damage for the data breach. And because we wanted the Supreme Court of the state of Minnesota, now in case law there, you own your data as your property. And for those listening that don't know what data ownership really means, um, it's using the strongest part of our legal framework. Most legal frameworks around the world protect property is number one. Human rights and protecting it is very nebulous, unfortunately. That's just the truth of the matter. Um, I've worked in international and local human rights courts for a lot of my life. It is very difficult to win. But if someone damages your property, you bet you're going to win and you're going to get compensation. So owning your data as your property means that you have the rights over your personal information and that if someone wants to have access to it, I would say that the best uh, analogy I have is like the Airbnb model, which is, you know, if you want access to my property, you tell me who you are what you want to use it for, for how long, and we agree on a price, and I get paid before I hand away the keys. And I really see that as the future of data ownership, especially the monetization of this data. And working at the local level to start to secure these types of laws is what is eventually going to get us that the ratification of those global agreements that we've had for decades now. Well, let me, let me, I, I got to ask. Wait, 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 Brittany, that's great. And let me bring Luke and Deli in on, the, on that. I'm going to jump in a little bit if I I want because I want cause what 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 Brittany said is let's set up a, a legal framework where you can get where you can where you can hold people accountable and where you can be, where you can not re, where you can get recompensed. So Luke and Deli, I know you guys have other thoughts about what we can do rather rather than you know ask for permission you know or forgiveness kind of thing here. You're right. I think you guys are very proactive in, in what you're doing in your daily lives to try and think about how you can change the conversation because the language you use to define a, a problem often limits how you consider the problem and the solutions you look for. And I think you guys both have interesting parameters that you bring to the table to try and change that conversation for individuals. So Luke, why don't you start with, with, with your thoughts? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to jump in. It stopped me if the connection gets bad. I'm trying to tether off my phone for some reason. It's a little bit uh, challenging today. But I, when I think about laws, those are essentially threats of violence. Mm. And it's important. And I really Camel commend off. what you are Camel doing, off. Brittany. I think it's very important. But ultimately, that's what it is. And, and we're trying to use threats of violence. Uh, again, I apologize. I, I do interviews all the time and haven't had issues. Uh, for whatever reason today is giving me a little trouble. But the idea that a, a law is important, that structure is important, that ratification is important. But ultimately, I look at property as an extension of myself. It's myself in the past. It's so inherent to my own self-ownership that is, it, it, it's not something that I have to. It's my, my in the past, I decided in the present to do something to create property. You do have to expose some information in order to interact with someone else. And that's critically in the and transparency. Deli, you want to pick up? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I think that what I realized 
pretty early in this um, endeavor is that you need a multifaceted stack. And so we sort of, I started to work on understanding that really you need like a combat to be effective. You need, I, I think we're all on this. I, I think one thing I will say is that the privacy and data space in terms of people like us who are fighting for data liberation and data ownership and data sovereignty, we all have the same net objective in mind, but we all have different sort of paths in terms of how to get there. And what became very clear to me is that you really need a stack that really includes ethics, law, economics, and technology. And you, all of those factors have to work in concert in order for you to actually be able to have meaningful impact. And I'm compl I completely agree with Brittany in the regards that human rights law traditionally has been very, very difficult to implement. But the importance of it from a moral compass perspective is unequivocal, right? So even though some of these things may be very hard to actually implement, we need to be very clear about what we're trying to achieve and what rights looks like in the first step, stance. But so I think that's an important component. But then I think the other thing is the technology really is transformational. You know, people talk about nation states like they're this sort of, you know, solid social structure that has been with us forever. But the reality is that there were 14 nation states like 200 years ago, right? And this idea of the, this, this organization around nation states is, is a transient governance framework. And, you know, when I first started, when I got into data, as I said, when I was looking at this whole thing about Web 3.0, what was very clear to me was that the actual structure of society was subject to change and that digital, that digitalization would drive a changing structure. So I think it's important when we start to look at how, what the potential of the future is here to, to not be limited by the structures that we have today. And, you know, when, so when you look at the national and local context, I, I completely agree. And I think this is one of the things that we've seen so dramatically with this COVID pandemic. We're at this stage now in, in social human evolution where we have some problems that are beyond the nation state. That's one of the things we've seen with COVID and it's gonna get real in 2021 in this regards that um, you know, certain things like global, like environmentalism and e the ecological catastrophe that we're in the middle of cannot be addressed simply by nation state entities. So we do need some sort of macro global frameworks in many regards, but then we need hyper localization in many regards at the other end of it as well. So I think there is going to be this restructuring between the top and the bottom, if you will, between the macro concepts and the grassroots concepts and technology can play a huge role. And of course, you know, bringing it all back to blockchain and which I know is a passionate space for all of us, that starts to give us the ability to start to put rules without necessary centralized rulers to, to take Luke's point in place um, that, that we can all agree on. And, and all abide by. Del Delhi, Delhi, you know, it's really interesting because you've hit on something really personal for me. So the, with COVID, and I've been quarantining in Vermont and, you know, really trying to, 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 to stay safe and to do the right thing. Uh, and then there's all these offers to me to get tested and to give information and to do contact tracing, you know, and, and I'm trying to do the right thing. I'm trying to put myself in that global context to protect people around me and my own family. But on the other hand, I don't want to give the government the information. Like I'm worried, like I don't do 23andMe. I think 23andMe is a joke. I would never do that, right? Uh, and so uh, so I don't understand, so how do we deal with this? Because what you're saying is so genuine and so right. It's, so, it's hard to argue with what you're saying. On the other hand, no, no, get away from me. You know, do you get that needle out of my arm and, and, and don't put anything in that computer. Well, well, absolutely. And I think, you know, the threat at the moment is you know, I think Yuval Harari was the first person to coin this term that I was aware of, is under the skin surveillance. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, Brittany can talk, you know, for in, 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 in with great authority about how behavior, you know, how be, did, did behavior monitoring has become so pivotal 
in influencing society, which is obviously the Cambridge Analytica story. But we're going now, where we're going beyond behavior to this level of physiology and phys physiognomy and this under the skin surveillance that is hugely alarming. In Sorry, me. physiognomy as in how your face looks? Am I hearing this? How, how your face is, what's actually happening under your face. That's where we're getting to now. How we, how, you know, it's molecular. It's actually like you know, whether you're having a blush response, whether you're micro expressions. Yeah. I mean, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, skin, your pheromones skin are changing. Skin, skin temperature. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Skin temperature. So we've developed an app at the okay. moment around COVID that basically allow enables us to deduce your oxygen saturation level just from looking into a cell phone camera. And this can be done, and at the moment, our app does it from you physically looking in the camera, but the technology can be applied to video. So technically you could take video footage of someone, analyze it and deduce oxygen saturation, heart rate variability, respiration rates, stress levels, all of this just from video footage. So this is what's actually happening within you rather than just how you're behaving. And James, I'm so glad you, you asked about contact tracing specifically because Delhi and I were so freaked out about it at the beginning mm -hmm. of the year that we wrote the first contact tracing data protection act um, for the United States, um, specifically like for, um, for the, the state of New York, because we basically said, hey, you know, if, if this is a viable solution and a lot of Asian countries have shown that it is, that if you can do contact tracing, that it can help save human life and help prevent the loss of life during a public health crisis, then this is good if people consensually opt in, number one. And secondly, if it is regulated, the use of the data. So in, in the law that we wrote, for instance, we, we put in, um, we put in uh, like uh, it, different stipulations that uh, only allowed the use of that data for public health purposes. So purpose limitation is what it's called. And it means that for instance, that data cannot be shared with law enforcement to track peaceful protesters, for example. And we put in you know, anti-discrimination clauses to make sure that data couldn't be used to discriminate against people who had come into contact with someone with coronavirus or had it themselves. And so I think until these laws are passed because that law is still not passed, although it got past many stages of the legislative process, until that regulation is through, I wouldn't use it. Although I know that there are certain Asian countries that now no longer are sitting there um, with, with everybody at home and they're able to reopen their economies because they were able to do automatic contact tracing because there are no data rights in those countries. And but so it's really it's important for us to- I wanna cut you off. Again, you're talking within the construct of the laws and the fact that we need the law means that we have a problem and probably means that the law doesn't solve the problem except on the surface, right? I and totally agree. And I, I like how Delhi talks about the stack that you require because I always talk about needing, you know, three legs of a stool, right? You need education, you need legislation and regulation, and then you need technology. Because in the end, the only thing that can protect your data is technology, that's it. And so the laws and regulations allow a technology allow people to use a technology with without that threat of violence as you said luke and so I, I spend a lot of time making sure that emerging technologies are legally allowed to be innovated in right and so i write a lot of blockchain and distributed ledger technology um laws to allow those uh, activities to be legal and those technologies to flourish but you also need the education for people to understand how to use that. I mean, we have tons of incredible privacy by design technologies, but if people are not educated on how to use them, they unfortunately default to something owned by Mark Zuckerberg or Google. And that's a disaster. Right? Well, I, I think, let, I think me, let me ask you a question. I think it's, uh, Hold on, guys, one second, because it's been fascinating. But I want to throw this out here, but you're something I wrestle with. And to use Delhi's example of you land in a new city, and Google restaurant search isn't enough. It's nice to have a tailored result. Is, I guess I'm gonna ask from, the, from every panel's perspective, is, pri is the issue that the data is private and it must be kept private or that you should always have the ability to know what is, being, what is known about you, but then surrender the privacy because you can get useful things when you surrender privacy. You can get Netflix recommendations, you can get Amazon recommendations, you can get the restaurant down the street that you wouldn't have thought of otherwise. And, and to Delhi's point, I guess the follow-up to that is, 
can you allow for spontaneity also? Because I can see the danger of being stuck in your own lane if you're always getting recommendations for things you wanted in the past and not discovering new things. So is it a forbidding, is it like a blockade or embargo of the data or is it more like they're allowed to collect but you need to have a choice about it? I mean, it's permission I, structures and, and smart contracts. So like Luke is the right person to talk about this, but mm -hmm. it, you know, it, if you have decided that you are happy for your data to be used for those types of recommendations, then a lot of people are going to opt into that. I, you know, I'm happy with that. That doesn't matter to me. But if there's purpose limitation, the legal concept that I talked about mm -hmm. earlier, where a company cannot use that data for any other purposes and sell it to thousands of other companies without knowing what they're going to do with it, that's the most important thing. So if you can stop that data from being for being used for other purposes, which again is a technology solution, not a legal solution in the end, then you can feel more comfortable saying, okay, you can use my data for those recommendations. And I'm not afraid that it's going to be used to target me for voter suppression campaigns in an election. I think one of the things that's key to think about is that we are basically digitizing our normal life as a species. We're a very social tribal species. We've been that way for many hundreds of thousands of years. And so we're taking this technology and it's changing who we are as a species. And we're trying to wrap our brains around it going, we're now a global tribe. We're not just this local tribe and all these facial expressions and all these things. We've evolved to really value these things. And it's really mm -hmm. important. So we're just, again, digitizing what we already do. We're becoming more human than our normal human selves. And this has gone all the way back to the invention of fire. And you're pre-digesting your food by you know the calorie count per neuron. And it's made us human. Our technology always makes us human. So I, I think that it's important to recognize that we are going to continually be human as we digitize our existence. And it's up to us to recognize the moment we send information out to the world, it's no longer ours. It just, it, it flows out there. I can encrypt something. I can encrypt it, put it on a CD, lock it in a safe, and now it's scarce and rivalrous property. Mm -hmm. But information itself is not scarce and rivalrous. It's it's just hey, rivalrous? all day long. Yeah, what do you mean when you say rivalrous? Can, can rivalrous meaning, meaning it's, there's a, uh, if I have it, you can't have it. There's a rivalry created by its mm. nature. And, and encryption allows for that. And to your point, Brittany, I think it's super critically important that we do not allow governments and, and those who have their own intentions prevent us from using technologies that allow us to be private. Some of these laws that are coming just freak me out where they're outlawing encryption as a weapon. And we've gone through cycles. This is what, I mean, even before Edward Snowden, this is what, uh, you know, uh, the internet's own boy, you know, there, there's so many people that have fought for their freedoms and, and the rights of the human to be private and to encrypt things. And at the same time, and that's another interesting example, he also exposed information that's like, this is JSTOR, this is like, our tax dollars paid for this information. There is information that should be completely transparent and public because we all benefit from it. We, we paid for it. And that's part of that, again, that, that tribal social nature. So I think that what, and to your point about education, for sure, is helping people recognize it's about encrypting things that need to stay private and being radically immutably transparent about things that are important as our tribal species. So for example, back to us blockchain-based social media, if you Google Luke Stokes, I've controlled that narrative for, for at least four years on the blockchain, but another probably 10 years because of my blogging. And so those who will go too far on the spectrum of just being all private about everything, as soon as they start stepping up to do something interesting in the world, those who disagree with them can blast the internet with all kinds of content and they don't get to control the narrative about themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's really scary and dangerous. So I'd actually uh, encourage those privacy advocates who are you know, not themselves online to recognize there's also a risk to, to being too private among a social species. Whereas if you are very public about the things that you represent and you are, now I have friends that text me their Facebook likes because they're too afraid of the clients they're gonna lose because I said something controversial about the government or about where we are as a species. And they'll be like, man, you're so on point. This is so amazing what you said, I completely agree, but I'm worried that I can't do this publicly because I might lose a client. You know, And it's like, that's the world we live in. There's this, there's this motivational financial system going where it's like, if you act correctly, you know, this is like the China credit scoring system. If you act correctly, mm -hmm. you can interact with us financially. If you don't, you're gonna be penalized. And that's a scary, scary world to to be in. And this is why I'm so passionate about blockchain, but not just blockchain, also the cryptocurrency that secures the blockchain. Because without that incentive to the validators of a network, it's not a secure network and it's not immutable. So the, the value of money itself is really important component to this because it's the reason we leave our families. There's the reason we go off and work, you know, eight plus hours a day is because we want this value, we want to control it and have a, a self-sovereign, you know, understanding of 
How do we interact with the world and how are we rewarded by that action? That again is a transparent price discovery mechanism that we can't escape if we get too private and focus too much on the privacy instead of saying we need both radical transparency and privacy. And we can control that with encryption. I love, I love that you're using those phrases. I just need to jump in because like Luke and I have never had this conversation. And in most of my talks, I say that I'm not essentially a privacy advocate. I'm a radical transparency advocate. But the only way that you can be radically transparent is to know that if you want to keep something private, that you have the technology and the rights and the education in order to do that. Like since I was little, I've always, uh, you know, followed the cypherpunks and love the idea that cryptography is freedom. And it's really the truth. And so it's kind of impossible for governments to outlaw it. I think it's funny that they're even trying to do that. Like they try to outlaw Bitcoin, like not possible. Um, good luck with that. Like shut down the entire world's internet. Okay, like literally not happening. You can still, it, you can still do this offline. We've all figured out how to do that. So like it, it's, it's not possible to outlaw. So that's why I work with legislators to understand why all of this should be legal because they can't make it illegal. So let's work with it and let's integrate it into the global economy, right? But the radical transparency part, I think, is so important because I feel like there's a lot of privacy advocates that I have very difficult conversations with because they say we need to be able to keep everything private. And I said, OK, well, what's your plan for solving most of the world's problems? Mm -hmm. I am an advocate for data science. I'm an advocate for distributed ledger technology. I'm an advocate for artificial intelligence and robotics, where I think that most entrepreneurs that are building these types of technologies care about making the world a better place. If you decide to encourage everyone to keep things private, which is kind of a scaremongering tactic to say, if you share your data, you're going to be abused. Someone's going to do something bad with it. Instead, give people the education, the technology and the rights to keep private what you need to keep private and then to share everything else in a way that is protected and transparent and consensual and where there is you know, an incentive structure for us to do so. No, I, I, Sally, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to chime in, and and I, I agree. I think when we talk about what's going on here, it wasn't me this time. I know. <laughs> I'm thinking the gods are against us. What I like is that Delhi, like me, whenever he gets caught, gets caught with his mouth open. So it's good. <laughs> <laughs> I seem to be okay here. I can't see myself holding. Can you hear me? Now? Start again. Start again, Dali. Yeah, no, I was I was just saying that, you know, I think one of the challenges with when we think about data generally is we often get locked in this thing about privacy and privacy is critical, you know, but I think when you think about human rights generally as principles and when you think about it in cyber context, there are three real important pillars and one is privacy. Um, one is property and the third is freedom. But I think the challenge is that quite often, I mean, if you look at something like the right to free speech, for example, which is really about radical transparency, right, in, in, in many regards versus the right to privacy, these are sometimes polarized issues and it's a very complicated space. So on one hand, yes, we need privacy, but then also, you know, the, the, and that's where, you know, the property rights are so powerful because by way of having property rights around your information, you then have agency in terms of how much privacy works for you versus how much doesn't. And that's what it ultimately comes down to. It's ultimately the quest is around agency and freedom in this regards. So, you know, it is a, one of the challenges, I think, you know, people often say that data is the new oil and data is the new currency, which mm -hmm. is true in many regards. But the thing about data is it is a resource unlike any resource we have ever encountered before in human history. Yes, we, and, and I think Luke, you, you made a really interesting point about the nature of information and how it wants to be out there. Information wants to be discovered in that regards. So. In, in that regards, you know, we have to look at the dynamics of data in a much more multifaceted, complex manner than any other resource that we've ever looked at before. And sometimes we need privacy, sometimes we need um, complete um, access and, and availability, like in the pandemic, right? Because we've got real public health issues that we need to have data out there so that we can actually address. 
So it's really about, I think for me, the real critical thing in this, in this world is really about, it's, it's, you've got to understand about the importance of making data available. And there are economic issues around that as well that are very salient that have to be addressed. Like the, you know, the data dividend bills, for example, address some of these factors. Can you explain um, that as sorry? The data dividend bills? Yeah, it's a bill, and uh, really can talk to it more authoritatively, but uh, it, I think California has been leading the charge on this. It's basically about the right to be able to earn money from your data effectively. Mm. Yeah, um, it means that it, you, have the, you have the right to know if any companies are monetizing your data and to get a dividend of that value. Which is phenomenal because I think that's the issue. It's property, right? And you do have, you should be able to benefit from the economic upside of your property in that regard so that's that's, that's funny it's almost like a mechanical license and copyright which you know you can't stop someone from playing your song but if they do play your song they will get that check every couple months for a few pennies absolutely and copyright though i think you know this is where we're getting to very quickly in terms of this data as property aspect it is ip when you think about data as your memories your histories your experiences your desires your feelings your thoughts that's your IP effectively. So I do think that IP law has a really critical part to play in terms of this. Um, I, I think the information, I mean, if you're gonna manage your own information and, and treat it like property, I can see a huge challenge in understanding what the hell this data about you means and the different formats and the consequences of it. And I, I think it's not just accessing and choosing how to use it, but rendering it understandable. And I, I personally don't know how to handle that. Address and, that. and in, in uh, you know, we've been doing a lot of work around that for, for, for the last decade, effectively, trying to develop a nomenclature of framework. I call it like a periodic table for information, mm -hmm. because I think you're right. And, but ultimately, look, it comes down to a couple of very simple things. Really, it comes down to what is the sensitivity of information that you are sharing and what is the level of identifiability? And I think this is the key thing when we come to data sharing. You know, if you think about privacy in, the, in a digital world, there are only three ways you can be private in a digital world. One is to be completely off grid and just not participate. The second yeah. is to be invisible in terms of your participation and your footprint. And the third is to be anonymous, you know, and really and truly, or you could say pseudonymous perhaps is a fourth, but that's a kind of degree of anonymity, right? So really the question is what's, nature of engagement do you need to have on those four spectrums or five if you go to identifiable right so are you off grid are you invisible are you anonymous are you pseudonymous or are you identifiable right and that's how we need to look at each transaction each interaction from through those that lens and establish what level of identifiability do we have across those and that gives us a lot more hmm. control and safety in that context. If, if I could jump in, another point of this conversation we haven't gotten to yet that I think is really important is the importance for individuals to be able to be completely private while we want corporations, organizations, governments to be completely transparent. Meaning I want to know what that nonprofit spent every single penny on. I want to know what my tax dollars went to. I want to know what that government is doing. Now the break, and that is a beautiful idea in concept. The breakdown for me practically uh, is where, when I have the guy who did the books for Enron, right? That was an individual, right? There are individual bad actors within an organization that don't, in my perspective, deserve that level of, you know, they, they have to, as individuals, become transparent because of their actions and what they've done within the framework of a transparent organization. So if the transparency leads to, okay, here's the guy, provably, these are the people that, that were bad actors. You know, sorry, my, my network is dropping again, I noticed, but I'm what waiting for it to pick no, up no, again. I can hear you. So as those as those people get identified within a transparent organization as individuals, I think they've forfeited their rights to be remain private because they've harmed other human beings and there has to be a recourse for that. Now the flip side of that is I think there also has to be a mechanism for forgiveness. And this is a really important thing when we talk about the immutable technology of blockchain. If you do something and you are a harmful actor and that goes on your permanent record, I mean, for real, your permanent record, what's the process for reconciliation? What's the process for rehabilitation? How do we say, okay, we know that you did this terrible thing and you harm people. And we know that those people have come back to you and you've reconciled with them and they no longer hold you, uh, hold, you you've paid your dues, 
let's say you went to prison or you went to some kind of reform school, like, or whatever it might be, you're supposed to be rehabilitated at that point. You're supposed to have a clean slate. You know, it's, it's we don't talk about those things anymore because you dealt with that and now you get to rebuild your reputation. Like that, I think is an important key to this to say, look, you can be private as an individual, absolutely. But you also have to recognize that if you harm others within the context of transparency, you're going to be outed. But unlike the, you know, the, the Chinese system where they get to like use behavioral economics and control every aspect of your life based on whether you, you know, bow to our dear leader or not, we have to come up with a situation where there's accountability that's cross-cultural, there's accountability that's across multiple religious perspectives, that you're not going to be harmed in one generation and, you know, a few decades later be considered a hero. That's, that's historically what we see as a problem. There's someone who's like the bad guy that we're going to put out a stake and burn him at the stake, but really they were bringing some perspective, you know, hey, actually, you know, the sun is the center of our, of our solar system. This is important, right? We want to grow as a species in our understanding, self-awareness and all these things. So I think it is important that we, we walk that fine line to say, okay, yes, individuals, you can be private up until the point you cause harm to others. And at that point, and this is the challenge, governments come in and use that as an excuse to say, well, that's why we need the backdoor encryption key. We need to be able to unlock that person's phone. And, and that's a point where I just say, I can't go there. At that point, we have to, as individuals, hold each other accountable and say, that's my neighbor. And I just don't interact with them anymore because they're a bad actor. You know, we need sh social shaming, ostracization. These are things we do in our tribes and we have to have a way to do that. And that's what you have with the block. If you want to block someone, you should be able to do that. And so they cannot but, inject them. Look, aren't our tribes so large and amorphous and shifting that ostracism isn't what it used to be? That's a really good point. And actually, I've heard people talk about generationally it's different because there were generations that were like, if you're friends with someone, you're friends with them forever. And the later generations like, whatever, I got a million people on my Snapchat. I don't have to be your friend. I'll just, you know, you're done. I'm going to be friends with whoever I want now. And they have a different con, you know, understanding of commitment to friendship even it's really interesting so one, oh, of, our, one of our viewers Sir, my friend sergio maldonado is on he made a comment about the idea that you that you, there's a chain of custody for data and that and for your for your privacy and for your not and for people's knowledge about you and that that one of the essential things is you need to be left in control of that chain of custody and i think that goes to a bigger point uh which is that um i think that we're that this idea of local government or whether government has the right to control these issues or not, or whether it matters where you were, where your mother was standing when you were born, that then determines how you get to deal with your own identity, you know, uh, and, and the ability to deal with other people. You know, I think that these things are going to keep evolving over time. But one of the places that I look and I think is important is what are the rules, right? Like Brittany was talking before about laws. And I was like, That's, I said, those laws are great, but they're really lies, right? Because they tell you how you should act, but other people aren't acting that way. So what I like about distributed ledger and what I like about the open platforms is that I don't, I understand not every outcome is going to be the way I want it to be, but I would like to be fully informed what the rules were when I started to participate mm -hmm. and to understand those places I made myself vulnerable and that I accepted that trade at that time. Because I don't think we're going to solve, everyone has a different interest and everyone has a different sensitivity level for different items. And so I don't think there's a blanket solution for everyone, but I think instead what we need to do is strive to make it so that everyone understands what the trade-off is that they're making. And, mm -hmm. and so therefore you can decide I'm okay to be exposed to it, right? Or, or you know what, these are things I'm going to hide. Or when I'm dealing with Luke and I'm doing a transaction, I know that there is a remediation process. And it's possible that there's some things missing there because I only have seven years of, of, of records and I know that he had the ability to, to get rid of after seven years, that he had the ability to hide things. And so maybe he's hiding, maybe he's not, but I'm on notice that that's how the system works. So I, so I so I've even the playing field. Brittany, well, James, 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 I'm sorry, let, let me ask you a question because I want to follow up on, your, on what you said and that was good. I mean, so you're, you're a smart guy, but you're busy and you're, you're running a lot of stuff. If, if you... I guess to my original concern, if there's all this data about you being held by all these different actors in different formats and maybe in some kind of raw form, how do we, not being the Britneys and the Lukes and the Ds of the world, how do we, you and I, you know, ex-lawyers, heaven forbid, or lawyers, understand our choices you, even if we have access? But I told you not to tell anyone who's a lawyer. Um, so, uh, so, but I think that that's, the answer is, you know, the Einsteinian answer, uh, the other Einstein. Gordon. Yeah, uh, the smarter one. Which, which is education, 
right? The, the thing, the, 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 the core, th you know, people value money, you know, as being the, 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 the razor for, for, for all these determinations. But, yeah, but, the, but I think at the end of the day, knowledge, you know, and education and experience are the real tools. They're the real assets that, you, that can't be taken away from you uh, and that each person can do. And, and so I think that we have this obligation. And I know, you know, we're all thinking in our mind what's going on in the real world right now you know, and, and the, the conundrum of education and perspective and et cetera. Uh, but I think that, that we have an obligation now to have a different set of education for globally uh, for everyone and just get the Khan Academy working on a global scale and make it free to everyone so that, so that they can have a basic understanding of what is your content. What's the idea of, of your personal information as property and mm -hmm. property rights, right? Is such an interesting concept that we that we that we could share globally. Uh, so I think that that the answer is that everyone should be you know the Gordon. I can't control what people think of me or what or, or, or what or what they see. I've given up on that in a lot of ways. I try and protect it, but I also understand once it's in digital form, it's gone. Right, the horse is out of the barn. The idea that you can do anything private, right, or anything that you put digital and not think that you're sharing it, I think you're fooling yourself. I would beg to differ a little bit on that because I think the technology is a, a, a here for us to be able to do to to. Uh, here to, comes the sales pitch. No, no. I mean, I'm not going. I'm not going to give you it. But I mean, I do think that we have the technology. You know, that I've always I've said this for a while. Our, our biggest challenge right now is imagination as a species. You know, we actually have the technologies to achieve. You know, beyond our beyond a lot of what we can imagine currently. I mean, don't quite time travel and these other things are all very conceptual, but there's a lot of stuff that we can do that we have the technology to do now. I do think that when it comes to digital privacy, that there is, it is, there is, there are tangible, meaningful ways to be pri to have privacy and property in a digital world. It's like IP. I mean, and look here, you know, James said, here comes a sales pitch. I, I will say that um, in our, we, we developed a protocol and to put it in very simple terms, you know, people often talk about how Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies enable money to be transferred as easily as information. Our protocol is really about enabling information to be transferred as securely as money. And that's where we're at, right? Because money is just a form of information. And if we have this really robust way of ensuring that we don't have leakage and, you know, and, 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 and theft in the interactions and transactions around our money, then we can use a similar system for the transfer of information to some extent, in which goes to Luke's point earlier about the nature of information itself wanting to be out there. But in terms of how we transact and share it and move it from place to place, we do actually have the technology to enable that to be done in a, in, a, in, a, in a very secure and contained manner, particularly with blockchain and crypto. I, I feel like this is a great little like uh, lead up to me able to do my little pitch, if that's okay. Because <laughs> what we're doing with Bio is very similar in that we're trying to make the systems for decentralized self-sovereign control of your value, your, your cryptocurrency, your NFTs, you know, all these interactions you're gonna have more and more on DLT technology. You know, the, the, the digital letter technology is so important as far as the future of our species and where we're going. It's just, it's inevitable to me. I've known this for almost eight years now, but we have to make it as easy as the centralized solutions. If we don't, we're going to have people come in and say, oh, okay, look, I can do this. You know, I look at PayPal, for example, as the like AOL of cryptocurrency. It kind of introduces people to it, but it's not the real internet, right? It, was on, it wasn't until you went, and I remember the little CDs that we would get, you know, my friends and I, AOL accounts, you know, their dial-up modem cranking away. But it wasn't until you mm -hmm. clicked that little globe icon, you're like, what is that? And you go, oh, the World Wide Web. Oh my goodness, this is amazing. And I really, like, I feel like just like Netscape and these other, like the HTTP protocol enabled you to have the opportunity to experience the World Wide Web and a great user experience, you know, links, things, forms, things you could click. And I think that, you know, what we're trying to do with the field protocol, you can have human readable usernames, you know, Luke at Stokes is my crypto address. And you can send a request for payment or you can send memo data. And it's just as easy as the centralized solutions of PayPal and, and you know, Venmo and those type of things. And we also have this concept, again, about field requests and field data so that between two people you know, using Diffie Hellman, we have a shared key. We can have an encrypted message. One of our partners at the Tribe Wallet built a chat system 
which is something we never even imagined using the record OBT data method that you can encrypt data between two people on a chain. So I do think there's these amazing innovations, even this phone call right now, the link we clicked to get into this Zoom call, the technologies involved, we, we would, you know, Netflix and all these other things, we wouldn't even have imagined that when I was first building websites in 1996, like I couldn't, you know, animated GIFs were a cool thing back then. And here's what we have today, right? So I can't even begin to imagine what this cryptocurrency blockchain space is going to create once we have protocols that transcend the tribal boundaries of how these different groups interact. When we can say, hey, we all have this shared understanding of how we send and receive data, how we do it securely, how I can be Luke at Stokes, for example, completely transparent, everyone knows that's me. And I can also have a whole bunch of other field addresses that nobody knows about if I want to. If I'm per perhaps going to donate to WikiLeaks and someone might feel that that's a scary thing to do. If I want to go and you know whatever I choose to do with my self-sovereign nature, as long as I have privacy coins and as long as I have the ability to hopefully do mixers and things like that, I'm a little concerned and it somewhat relates to this conversation about the loss of fungibility. I mean, that, that Bitcoin is no longer that. Like you can actually censor specific Bitcoin based on the ability to track all of this information. And that makes it uh, less interesting uh, from a privacy perspective, if you were going to, you know, and I love what you said uh, uh, about that sensitivity of data. That's such a beautiful thing. If we had a way to measure the, the actions that we're doing and educate people saying, hey, I noticed that you live in Afghanistan and I know that you're about to do this thing. And I noticed that the people, the warlords might kill you for that. This is a very sensitive thing you're about to do. Please be cautious, right? Empowering the individual to be that self-sovereign controller of their own data and their own identity also comes with tremendous responsibility because it may not even be them that's harmed. It might be their family. It might be their, their associates. And that's the, the challenge with Facebook. Even if you create a very secure protocol for how you interact online, your friends that you're connected to may not have that protocol. And they can, as Brittany could tell you, they're slurping all your data as just being part of your friend's uh, circle. And I, I, I want to jump in here on, on two topics. One is that I, I think it's uh, funny that when, when you talk about um, you talk about, you know, being afraid to take, you know, certain, uh, to do certain data transfers. And you mentioned uh, donating to WikiLeaks. In 2011, all of the Bitcoins that I had, hundreds of Bitcoins that my friend used to send me from his mine in Mongolia, I donated them all to WikiLeaks in 2011 um, wow. because, uh, you know, WikiLeaks was blocked from using any other form of, of gathering donations besides Bitcoin. And I had these all these Bitcoins and nothing to use them on. So I sent them all to Julian. That got me in a lot of trouble a couple of years ago, even though obviously it was, you know, six years later, what have you. Anyway, um, I still recommend that, that you donate to that organization. Anyway, um, I think it's really important to go back to what a, a few of you guys have talked about. Luke, you mentioned shared understanding and James was talking about, uh, you know, what is the way that we can globally educate people in order to get to the type of of shared understanding that you're mentioning, Luke, so that we know how to use these technologies, we know how to protect ourselves, we know how to either protect our privacy or how to share data anonymously or pseudonymously, whatever it happens to be. And um, that's one of the main things that I'm working on right now, besides the legislative stuff and advising plenty of you know blockchain and encryption companies. Uh, on the education front, I started my Own Your Data Foundation in order to teach a new global curriculum called DQ. And what DQ is, it stands like IQ or EQ, it stands for a digital intelligence quotient. And it's been developed over the past 10 years by most of the world's top technology think tanks and universities and departments and ministries of technology and innovation, and a lot of the top like activist groups. And this, um, this indicator set gives you a DQ score, like an IQ or an EQ. And a couple months ago, it became the new IEEE global standard in digital literacy education. And so what this means is that over the next many years, we're gonna be working to get it into every single curriculum in every country around the world. It's backed by the World Economic Forum, IEEE, OECD, UNICEF. And um, we just got the, the first national program um, where by 2022, the entire uh, you know, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia will have it in every single school in, in the entire uh, country, which is incredible. Um, and what this curriculum does is it teaches you everything from what are your data rights to uh, basic cybersecurity protocols to protect your privacy. It teaches you media literacy to spot fake news and disinformation and hacking and phishing attempts. It teaches you how to manage your screen time 
and how to rid yourself of technology addictions to protect your mental and physical health when engaging in a digital life. I, I need that. Yeah, no, you know, I don't know, or, or, I don't know anyone who doesn't need that except for my mom. <laughs> right. I mean, it teaches you how to use emotional intelligence online on social media so you don't become a troll and you're not a victim of cyberbullying. Like all of these things that I really, really wish that, yeah, DQ, DQinstitute.org, correct, Luke. And so, um, and so what this would mean is that we would actually have this basic shared global understanding. And so the, the first big curriculum that we're pushing is for eight to 12 year olds around when, student, uh, when kids get their first device. So I, I've found when teaching digital literacy to adults, there are so many people that have all these blocks in their mind with terrible bad habits that we've developed over our whole life. Because when we were in school, we were taught, hey, here's a keyboard. Here's how you type an email. Here's how you use a search engine. But no one ever told us everything you're typing is being recorded and then bought and sold and traded around the world uh, without your knowledge or explicit consent. And it's going to be there forever and you can't get it back. No one told us that, but guess what these days you need to tell kids that they need to have that understanding so that they know if, if they want to keep something private, that maybe you text your friend to go meet you on the playground. And then you have that conversation because certainly if you're using a school email system, the thing that you're telling your friend or something that you're searching for on Google is not going to remain private. So it, it's so important to have this type of education, again, not as a scaremongering tactic, but a way of empowerment to actually say, you know, this is how you can lead a successful digital life and use technology every single day and feel confident that everything you want to keep private is private and everything that you want to share, you have done safely, right? Absolutely. And, and you know, I, I will look, I, and I think the education and starting with the, you know, with the younger generations is, is 100%. And I'm, you know, completely agree with Brittany in that regards. And the DQ Institute is a phenomenal um, initiative. And we're working with Brittany and the DQ guys with our comic series in that regards as well. But, but I think the, you know, the, the other side of it as well is innovation. And I think that's where it's really, it, it, it's in our hands. And it's a bit of a game of whack-a-mole, you know, on one hand, you've got the, the there is a real and a clear and present danger, right? A real threat of entities out there that do want to continue to take our data and use it against us for nefarious ends. And, they're, and they innovate <laughs> in many regards as well, right? But I think on the other side of the, of the equation, um, the, the, we are, our movement, um, is we, we effectively need to continually innovate. And when I talk about innovation in that sense, and of course the whole crypto blockchain space is a, you know, that is a critical innovation um, uh, ecosystem in this space. But that also includes things like user experience design. That also includes things like how do we make this stuff you know, relatable, tangible into terms of things that people can emotionally engage with? How do we take the concept of data as property and actually translate it into something that people can navigate in their day-to-day -day lives? And so I think there's a huge responsibility and opportunity for us as technologists and as entrepreneurs to innovate in this space as well, um, that, that to, to, to actually address these issues. I wanted to comment on that because actually I think I completely agree. And I think it's a really important point. I've had conversations with certain people and, and you know, uh, James and Gordon, you know, like some intense conversations with some people who are convinced that this is so dangerous. This is Pandora's box to be doing any type of identity reputation system that even comes close to a uh, immutable blockchain that it's like, you know, it's, it's just poison. It's kryptonite. It's like, don't even have the conversations, you know? And I, I tried to get a conversation going with uh, Ian Grigg and Vinay Gupta and others who, who've been, you know, spending decades of their career in this uh, space. I'm sorry, Luke, I, I think you actually tried to have a conversation with Vinay. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and it's just- no, you know, no, that, 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 that was the first- okay. Okay. It's all good. <laughs> Do you see the cat behind me? I mean, that, that cat tried to have a conversation, the other side, tried to have a conversation with Vinay, and now it's lying there dead on that seat. Yeah, I, I love Vinay. He's phenomenal because he he takes this very very seriously, as it should be taken seriously. And and I, you know, my friend Xavier Hawk, for example, he gave presentations that the CCP used to create their social scoring system that actually literally controls people's lives, and it's very dangerous, right? These are things again going back to the original demo side idea. These are things that are really important for us if we care about human life. 
you know, I don't want to do the whole what about ism thing here. That's not what I'm going for. Like everyone's got their own passion, but I do want to highlight if we care about the weight of a human life, 260 million people that shouldn't be dead is a big number. And we should be serious about how governments are given this control because of our belief in authority. We literally believe in authority and it's very tribal. You know, it's something that is part of our evolution. It's, it's served us very well, but it can also be very, very dangerous. And so thinking about this and thinking about, okay, we do have to innovate. We do have to have these conversations and it has to be moral, ethical people with solid reputations within their communities because it's going to be built. It's inevitable. And we have to make sure it's done by people who care about human life and care about well-being and care about you know the ability to function, right? That's a great definition of well-being that I've enjoyed listening to lately. So, so I agree, we can't stifle innovation and we certainly can't stop people and say, well, you can't use blockchain or crypto or you can't use encryption because you know a tiny fraction of a percent of people might do bad things. It's like, look, a brick, you can break a window or build a house. The technology is not gonna stop. We can't be Luddites on this. We have to move forward. We have to do it with self-awareness and understanding and really with an elevated evolved consciousness that really doesn't have any entropy, that there's no friction for our capacity for love when we're in that state of mind, right? We're not worried about a like that's gonna lose us a client because we're fully self-sovereign and we control our own existence. Now, again, I know that's a very privileged position, but isn't that where we want everyone to be? Don't we want all the people to rise? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, here's the next question. Do you wanna force them to be that way or do they have the right to not be that way? Yeah, no, excellent point, Gordon, because I think a lot of people literally, because of where they are in their mind, and it really is a mental thing, they want to be ruled. And it's very discouraging as someone who loves voluntarism. And again, this concept of without archons, without rulers, you know, uh, and it's the real meaning of anarchy. I get discouraged sometimes when I see some of my fellow humans who are like, no, I just want to be told what to do. And I just want to be told uh, what to do by the strong man who's the, who's the authority. And I, I think that worked for a really long time, but I do believe as a species, we're entering a new age, a new era where we have to take personal responsibility. We have to understand that freedom and self-sovereignty is a beautiful, wonderful thing. And it's a little scary and that's okay. And we can become human adults and we can make it. Now, what do you do? What do you do about the older person with diminished capacity? You know, the 80 year old grandma who you love and but doesn't just doesn't have the timeline or the facilities to become what you're it's not a choice, just can't. What do you yeah, do? It, and so this is like, I'll, I'll, and then I'll shut up a little bit. But one of the things that I often challenge my anarchist and voluntarist friends, voluntarist friends with is this simple concept of how are we going to protect those who cannot protect themselves? because they might be physically unable or they might be mentally unable or they might be economically unable to do so. And that is a challenge that I continually repeat because it, it goes back to another core idea of, do you value the freedom or do you value the well-being that the freedom brings you? And if, you, if you're too focused on freedom and it, you can- be I always say people say or when they really mean and. Exactly, and that's the answer. The best answer to that question that I found so far when I interviewed different you know, voluntarists or, or libertarian candidates or things, the best answer is, well, they're one and the same. I have to have the freedom to choose what my well-being is. And my well-being might be a little bit different than your well-being, but as long as I'm not causing you harm, and this is, again, where the non-aggression principle and things like it are important, if we have an understanding of that, then, yeah, you can be free to express your own well-being, and that's really important. James, so go ahead. Let me go into God mode for a second here. I think we're going to end at uh, 1045, which is in 20 minutes. Oh. Uh, conversation's been fantastic so what, what i would like to do is have each of you guys talk about bring it more bring it more personal again right you talked about these you know about these uh battles that are going on about these frictions uh and you know cognitive dissonance that we have to deal with between privacy and identity talk to me about you guys as individuals what are you doing yourself how do you manage your interaction with the world knowing what you know and, and what's the keys that you think, what are, what's important to you as guideposts that people could start to use and incorporate into their lives? Brittany? So as I've said uh, at least once, maybe twice on <laughs> during this chat is that in the end, it's only technology that can protect you. If you wait for the law or a social media company or big tech to protect you, you're gonna be waiting a really long time. Um, perhaps forever. So it's really important to make sure that the tools that you are using in your daily life are privacy by design. You know, 
for instance, I, um, I just got rid of my iPhone and I'm about to get rid of my MacBook Pro and get Apple products out of my life forever. Um, I've gotten now a clear phone, uh, a blockchain enabled OS where my um, GSMA IMEI number is directly connected to the public key of my digital identity, not to my phone number, not to my name. And it's impossible to get data out of the phone unless I've consented to it. And if I have consented to it, then I get paid on the debit card that comes with the phone. So it's the first ever own your data phone. Um, and you know, even before that phone existed, I had started migrating most of my communications off of uh, you know, platforms like WhatsApp. Um, anything owned by Mark Zuckerberg. I haven't even had Facebook on my phone for maybe seven or eight years. Even before I worked at Cambridge Analytica, I got rid of Facebook on my phone. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, if anyone has Facebook on their phone, like delete that spyware right now. You can log into a Facebook account securely um, on a browser on your computer without it stealing all of the data out of your phone. But I want to go back to also something that's so important that I didn't get to jump in because Luke and Deli were, um, you know, just, just so cleverly talking about the different aspects of consent and opt-in and, and smart contracting. But what I think is, is so important is the fact that, you know, most people, most of the apps that are on your phone are apps that you probably will never use again, or you barely use, and you're letting them sit there collecting all of your data all of the time. So what I want for everyone that is listening to me right now to go and do is to go into your phone and every app that you haven't used in a while, delete it. And if you think you really need to keep it on there, read the terms and conditions. I know a lot of them are 20, 40, 50 pages written in legalese, which is lawyers speak for, we're going to write something that you can't understand what you're agreeing to, but no, you would never allow someone to walk into your office and give you a pile of papers, paper contracts, where you're flipping to the end of the contract and signing it without reading it all day long, flip, sign, flip, sign. That is what you are doing all day long when you do not read the terms and conditions. When you accept cookies, you are signing digital contracts. And perhaps all of these apps on your phone are getting access to all of your contacts, your photos, your videos, the data you're creating in other apps, your live location. And a lot of them can even turn on your microphone and camera whenever they'd like. That's a reality. And you're just letting maybe hundreds of companies do that all day long, like delete that. Start thinking in a way to protect yourself. Think of what you need, not what you want because we continually give away our privacy for convenience. You know, use Brave Browser, DuckDuckGo, not Google products. Use ProtonMail instead of Gmail. There are so many things that you can do in your daily life to protect your identity, to protect your most private information to control those data flows. You know, it's, it's very possible. There's a million solutions to this. It's just actually taking the time to do it. So, you know, you could be using voice.com instead of Facebook, um, where I'm starting to produce all of my content there and then just reposting my voice link where you actually own all of your data in there. And, you know, I'm, I'm not really interested in giving any more of my data, which to me is digital money to, you know, platforms that are not interested in my best interests or to even pretending like they want to protect me. So I start thinking in that manner. And eventually you're going to be a lot more successful because our privacy in the past is gone. We can't go and get all of our data back, even though a lot of the laws that have recently been passed allow you to demand a full copy of your data from governments and companies and then demand the right to delete and to revoke access to, or revoke consent to be marketed to, whatever that happens to be. But that process to get your data back from millions of databases is a disaster and I don't see it as a reality. What I really see is that what we wanna do is protect all of the data that we produce from here into the future and that our children never have this problem, that their data is protected from before the time that they are given their first device. Right? So that's what we're looking towards in the future because our privacy is gone. But I know from working as a professional in the data science industry that the most important data is new data. 
the most important data is fresh data or live data. <laughs> and if we do not allow access to that, to companies that want it, and they have to get our consent in order to get access, then that flips the incentive structures. And all of a sudden, there has to be an incentive for us to consent. And that's when data ownership as a property right starts to come in and you start to think, well, we could actually earn a universal basic income or an earned income off of consenting for our data to be shared with people who are monetizing it. You know, Delhi has a really interesting solution for that. I, I work with tons of people that are working on different components of that problem. But guess what? Joe Biden just became president of America and guess who's probably gonna be CTO of America? Andrew you. Yang. Oh, and his presidential policy was that you own your data as a property right and that we should all have a universal basic income. The way to connect those things is that if we have the rights to the monetization of our data, even just the dividend off of it, that our universal earned income is going to come from our data, not from canceling social programs that the government already pays for. So think about that, because what's really tangible in our hands right now, and this comes from the human rights lawyer version of me, is that we have the opportunity to cure global extreme poverty. Because if we all have our data rights and we're able to protect our privacy with technology and only consent to our data being monetized, if we're going to be paid for it, then every single person on earth could at least feed themselves every day with the data that they produce. When are you running that's for what our opportunity is. When are you running for president? <laughs> I'm not old enough yet. <laughs> oh my God. Senator. We'll change the rules, Brittany. We'll change the rules for you. Uh, Deli. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree. I, I think, um, you know, what, I mean, in terms of what I'm doing personally, absolutely. I mean, I, 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 again, I think we're all, we all have a very similar perspective in terms of what's needed and where we're going. And so I, it, it, what I, what I, my, uh, most of my attention is focused on actually building solutions, building tools that actually can bring this to life. So my perspective in terms of, yeah, absolutely, I mean, you know, I think I, I try to do my best in terms of things like using things like DuckDuckGo and emerging tools that um, give you more privacy and sovereignty. But I suppose my greatest efforts there are building those kind of tools and actually making them accessible to people and trying to make them compelling and all whatnot. Um, I, I think the advice that I would give people in terms of what to do in this space, which, is, which I think really is what we're talking about in many senses, just to start thinking about your data like you think about your money. I mean, when you think about it, money is an even more abstract concept than data in that sense. And it's kind of, there's, there's, it's, it's just, it's, 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 it's nothingness. It's just numbers, right? When you really kind of unpack it. So the idea that your data could have value and that you could think about it and have that kind of emotional connection with your information shouldn't be so absurd. So I, I you know, I think once people can, I think where we are at in the kind of evolution of society, um, with regards to this is that if people can start to have that perspective on their data, a similar in framework and context. I mean, when you think about money, it's, you know, it's, it's math, right? And most people don't like math, right, in that regard. But we all still manage to kind of figure out how to work with our money and work with our bank accounts and, and all that because the impact that it has on our lives is so evident in that regard. So I think starting to think about data in that context will prepare people and give people the mindset and the perspective that's needed to embrace the tools and embrace the movement that's bringing more sovereignty and control around that. You know, I, the one thing I will say as well is that, again, I, it's important to, to be hopeful and to be, I, I don't think I call it optimistic, but, but positive on what the future potentially brings for us in this space. And I do think that we, that through these new technologies, dis, distributed technologies particularly, we are on the cusp of the greatest transfer of wealth in human history, the greatest distribution of wealth in human history. 
You know, when we look at think what we've been able to achieve with cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin primarily. I, I got to ask, is everyone saying that is the greatest distribution or greatest creation? Are we reallocating or are we making new? Well, this is the thing. You know, when you look at Bitcoin and what Bitcoin and what Satoshi managed to achieve with Bitcoin was to disrupt centralized creation of money and to, to create a, a system whereby centralized authorities couldn't interfere with the creation of currency of this value. But what Bitcoin failed at was this issue about the crushing the centralized distribution of money and this central centralization concentration of money in a few hands. Now, and this is one of the, these are the two things that we've, that, that the crypto movement has been trying to address. And we haven't addressed this issue about distribution of value. Data enables us to do that. And data enables us to do that. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, Luke. But data enables us to do that because actually you don't even have to distribute it because the data is already with the people, right? You just need to give the, pe the people a way to capture that and to, transact around it and this i think is what transforms everything because you the distribution is all is n inherently in the system already fantastic I, I actually uh the distribution of value uh, when i think about financial value i think it is shared storytelling I, I call it layer zero of the actual security of all of these networks when a blockchain or a cryptocurrency no longer has the community support the shared belief the shared storytelling and the value of the tokens, the security goes away and the, and the projects usually fail. And so when I think about the importance of that great shared storytelling, I also think about, as you're talking about distribution, token distribution is the number one uh, thing that causes a lot of projects to fail. And we like, for example, I was involved with EOS DAC. We did a big, you know, not me, but an, an airdrop was done uh, to a number of people and, and they didn't have a shared understanding of what the EOS DAC community was about. We were building DACs and DAOs, you know, DAC enabling. And we run into governance problems because of this misallocation of these resources to people who only want to speculate with a token, for example. And so thinking through how do we do a distribution of tokens, and this is another, to make it more personal, this is another reason why I'm so passionate about identity and uh, blockchain reputation is that I do see this as a way to solve that problem. If we actually could identify every conscious human being on the planet and we could distribute a token. If anyone could just say, hey, guys, I have an idea for value. It's going to be based on the number of trees you plant. It's going to be based on how you treat your relatives and your family and your kids and your neighbors, like whatever shared stories we could come up with. If we could just click a button and distribute that token to everyone in the world and then let the best story win, which one's more moral, which one's more compassionate, which one's more effective and efficient. Economy is supposed to be, you know, economizing our shared resources, our collaborative commons, these things. And it just doesn't currently happen in the current framework that we have for how we distribute and understand certificates of appreciation, these dollar bills that we trade back and forth with each other. But I do think this is why identity and reputation are so important because if we get it right and we get it in a way where we could say, okay, you are a, a, a human being and you have value in and of yourself inherently, intrinsically, right. then I can distribute something to you that's part of a story. And if we have enough people that choose to believe it, I back to Gordon's point, I think you are actually creating new value as the 20 something percent of USD is printed this year alone, you know, as that form of old value is being inflated away and people can stay in that system if they want, it's a free voluntary exchange. But ultimately I want to see more meritocratic systems, systems that value the individual systems that can tap into the reality of the shared storytelling. Instead of pushing it aside saying, no, no, we have these really great stock markets where we tell ourselves stories about price to earnings ratios and all these other things. And it's just a, it's the story, you know, with a different face on it, right? We get to the core of saying, do you believe in this? Do I believe in this? Does my community believe in it? Well, then I can have a shared competing currency, a local currency in my neighborhood, for example. And I can start actually interacting with my neighbors in an amazing way. And it's not controlled by, uh, you know, monopoly on the use of force in a geographic region. And that is an amazing opportunity we have. But it's also one that we have to be extremely careful about. Because as soon as you create this situation where you have to act or do or be or, you know, a certain way in order to get your distribution of your, of your earned universal basic income, uh, I'm very, very cautious. And I think we all should be about that. Because when you look at behavioral economics, this idea that, you know, you can participate in the economic world if you're a good actor, but then we have immoral psychopathic people in power determining what's good and bad. It's like, this is not a good plan. Historically, you don't have to be very intelligent to realize that this is a bad way to go, right? So I think that we 
we can do better. And, and we're, this, these conversations are part of it. So thank you again to James and Gordon for allowing people to come together, have these conversations and continue them. Fantastic. Wow. And so let me just do one last thing. Yeah, first of all, unbelievable conversation. Uh, I want you guys to know my mom was listening. So thank you for, for not embarrassing me. Um, and her, own, her only comment was, uh, make sure you turn off your camera at the end of it because, uh, you know, because you know what happens. So uh, exactly. So what I'd like to get you guys to do is each of you now, you've been so good about staying on subject and not chilling. I'd like to give you each a little window right now. To talk about the project that's in front of you that represents your, the, your, the embodiment of your passion that you'd like to talk to people about where you'd like them to go look after they, you know, after listening to this conversation. Deli, let's start with you. Um, so I think storytelling, I completely agree with Luke on that. So we've de we're developing a, we developed a comic series that's really about this space. It's fantastical. We, our elevator pitch, it's like the Matrix meets Mr. Robot on the road to Wakanda. <laughs> <laughs> so, but very exciting. It's called Mitaye Nights. Um, so you can go to mitayenights.com, M-E-T-A-I-Y-E. Nights, as in K-N-I-G-H-T-S dot com. That's um, really, and that's really about the power of storytelling because it's really how do we make this something that people can emotionally connect with. And then the other thing that we're working on is, um, it, it, at the moment, most is around um, COVID. And so we've developed this um, application we call Health ID. That's really about data sovereignty around our medical data and our health data, particularly in terms of COVID and enabling contact tracing and symptoms monitoring and analysis in a privacy preserving manner but in a, also in a way that enables us to create a commons a data commons that can be used for public good um where you know again it's that whole thing about and rather than or so let's have privacy and social utility oh yeah cool. <laughs> so um so yeah you can check that out as well so i think the um health id metame.com is really where you can find all the information about all of this stuff. So that's our kind of core mothership, metame.com, where you can learn more. Thank you. Luke? That was fantastic. I'm looking forward to checking out that comic, sharing it with my kids. I'm, I'm working, I'm the managing director for something called the FIO Protocol, FIO, the Foundation for Interwallet Operability. We are a Cayman nonprofit entity, fully decentralized, running a blockchain with 30 something validators from 20 different countries. FIO protocol, F-I-O-P-R-O-T-O-C-O-L, I guess, protocol.io. Uh, you can get yourself a free FIO address, uh, like you, depending on which wallet you want to use, whether it's Edge Wallet, Infinito, Konomi. Uh, we have a number of wallets, Garda, Midas protocol, uh, more and more growing Shapeshift, uh, many others as well, and even some exchanges. Actually, uh, even just today, just this morning, uh, the Liquid Exchange announced uh, support for the FIO token, and they are building support for the FIO protocol. So you can do deposits and withdrawals on the exchange just using a human readable address in a very private and secure way between those two parties. So I would encourage everyone to go check it out. My hope is this is how we're going to bring the next billion people onto crypto. We're going to make it simple and easy for them. It's not going to be stressful. It's going to be a joyful experience to interact with their own sovereign stores of value. And we're not going to have them compromise to centralized custodial uh, third-party risk, which would you know, eliminate the entire point of why we're in blockchain. They can have full control of their own NFTs, full control of their FIO address, mapping uh, whatever addresses they want, or just exclusively using FIO requests to maintain a higher level of uh, privacy if they want. And so I would love to get your feedback for those who are interested in this. And, and the obvious connotation here is that other KYC providers and exchanges could end up using FIO requests in a way to do the travel rule and to uh, uh, have verified identities and IDs with FIO addresses. These are all things that, you know, people have been approaching us wanting to do. And I'm kind of like, ooh, that's a little scary. But ultimately, again, we can't not innovate. We have to innovate going forward. And you can find me on uh, Twitter, uh, Telegram, uh, Hive. I really encourage you also to check out the Hive blockchain, uh, hiveonboard.com. Uh, I've been involved with that community for a number of years now. Uh, I'm, I'm Luke Stokes at all of those platforms, and I'd love to hear from you and continue the conversations. Thank you so much. Brittany? Yeah, thank you guys for organizing this conversation this morning. It was fabulous. Like so many of my favorite people in one place <laughs> um, and mm -hmm. some some amazing faces and minds that I haven't seen in a little while. And it's really great to catch up on my favorite topics. Uh, so I, I'd really love if you guys uh, want to know more about DQ and the digital literacy education that I do to go to ownyourdata.foundation. 
And if you guys want to get involved, just ping me and my team uh, by writing to info at ownyourdata.foundation. You can write to me personally at Brittany at ownyourdata.foundation. But um, I get quite a lot of emails a day, so better to ping my entire team so that somebody definitely sees it immediately. And uh, I'd love to you know, help you and your families or even your professional organization with that type of digital literacy foundation of knowledge, which, which helps everybody me be more successful. You know, obviously it's really important for kids to have the right foundation of education, but also the weakest link in any organization's uh, cybersecurity is one staff member that doesn't know how to spot a hacking or phishing attempt, right? So uh -huh. it's really important that everyone has that type of education. If you want to follow me on socials, I'm at own your data or at own your data now um, on, on nearly everything. So you'll, you'll be able to find me and uh, really looking forward to seeing you guys sometime very soon, hopefully in person, but uh, I'm sure virtually as well. Fantastic. And Gordon, what do you got? Oh, thank you. Um, I think my new job is show host and participant, but my other side job is I'm a, a lawyer. I do cryptocurrency and blockchain law exclusively, work with startups related to that, all the issues that surround them, uh, securities law, money transmitter, jurisdiction selection, tax, working with a lot of DAO projects right now, a lot, uh, which is part of how I know some of the good people on this show. And I used to say that my office was the world. Now my office is my studio city, the room where my one, the one room where my family doesn't intrude all the time. But hopefully COVID goes down soon, I get to see everyone in person. But yep, I'm a lawyer. Yeah. And I, you know, as my side gig, my main gig is working with James. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, really appreciate all you guys being here. Gordon, I love, I love this new series we birthed. DLT Fridays. It's going to be every Friday at 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to try and stick to big topics and, and make it personal where people can come and talk about their personal passions. Because I really, I believe that people, you know, where people have an unfair advantage and where, and where people can influence others really is based on their passion. Uh, and so thank you all for being here. We'll publish what the to topic is for next week on LinkedIn and social media as usual. And I, uh, you know, really enjoy being part of this community. Thank you for having me and, you know, have a great day. Same time. Thank you, Good job, everyone. Well. Thank you so much. Re really appreciate it. Please subscribe, subscribe to our YouTube channel so that Gordon can be happy and to our LinkedIn channels. <laughs> bye, guys. Make me happy. Okay, bye. Thanks, Thanks guys. Bye. Bye.